Welcome to a short introduction to organic chemistry and our first lecture on the alkane functional group. Because we're going to spend the rest of this quarter talking about organic chemistry, I think it's a good idea to start by talking about what organic chemistry actually is. We hear the word organic used a lot these days, especially in contexts like organic food or organic farming. When we hear the word organic used in that way, we usually associate it with meaning something that's more natural than an alternative. In that way, organic chemistry is organic because it often revolves around studying naturally occurring molecules. But as we'll see, there's plenty of non-naturally occurring molecules or synthetic man-made molecules that we can study in organic chemistry as well. So what does it mean for chemistry to be organic? Well, organic chemistry is always defined as the study of carbon-based molecules. You should remember from general chemistry that the universe around us is made up of matter, and that matter tends to be in the form of molecules. Molecules are made up of the atoms on the periodic table of the elements, and there's simple molecules like H2O, CO2, and there's also more complex molecules like proteins and DNA. Organic chemistry is the study of molecules that are based around carbon atoms. Essentially, the carbon acts like a skeleton or a backbone that other atoms are attached to. So organic chemistry is the study of carbon-based molecules. But why carbon? Why can't we study oxygen-based molecules or nitrogen-based molecules? Well, the real reason that carbon-based molecules get their own form of study in organic chemistry is that many of the molecules that make up living things and things that were once living are carbon-based. For instance, many of the molecules in the human body, as well as in plants, animals, and in other natural materials, are carbon-based. They are organic molecules. And the reason for this has to do with how carbon is able to bond. Because carbon is in group four on the periodic table, it has four valence electrons and needs to bond in order to get a perfect octet. What that means is that carbon is able to bond in many different ways. One way that carbon can bond is by having four single covalent bonds. Remembering that covalent bonds, and single covalent bonds in particular, have two electrons within them, having four single bonds would allow a carbon atom to have a complete octet. Another way that carbon can bond is through double bonds. For instance, having two double bonds. Each double bond contains four electrons, so having two double bonds will allow carbon to have a perfect octet. A combination of single and double bonds can also appease carbon and make it, energetically speaking, happy. Because if we use a double bond on one side and two single bonds on the other, we also create a carbon with a perfect octet. And finally, carbon's also capable of forming a triple bond. A triple bond has six valence electrons. So a triple bond alone can't make carbon be stable. But if we add a single bond to the other side, we have a carbon with a perfect octet. These four different modes that carbon can bond through are one of the reasons that carbon is the building block of life. Essentially, it likes to be at the center of molecules, and it makes a good backbone or skeleton to bond other molecules to. In that way, carbon-based molecules, or organic molecules, are often considered to be especially relevant to studying life. Carbon atoms tend to form a molecular skeleton, a backbone, if you will, of a molecule. The simplest organic compounds that exist are what are called hydrocarbons. You may or may not have heard this term before. But looking at the word, you can quickly surmise what it means. A hydrocarbon is a molecule that contains hydrogen and carbon. In other words, all the atoms in it are either hydrogen atoms or carbon atoms. The simplest hydrocarbon contains one carbon and four hydrogens. That allows the carbon to have a complete octet. More complex hydrocarbons can have many more carbons. 
and they can also have single bonds as well as double or triple bonds. For instance, this is another example of a hydrocarbon. Notice that even though there are many more atoms involved, they are all either hydrogen atoms or carbon atoms, and we have both single and double bonds occurring. We'll also run into molecules that are in a cyclic form, meaning that they make a circle of carbons. This is another example of a hydrocarbon because, again, it contains nothing but carbon and hydrogen. Not all organic compounds are hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are simply the simplest of the organic compounds. When we study organic compounds in general, not all organic compounds are hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are just the simplest of the organic compounds. And in fact, as we start to look at more and more complex organic compounds this quarter, you'll notice some interesting changes. In addition to carbon and hydrogen atoms, organic molecules can include single bonds. They can also include double and triple bonds. As we've seen, hydrocarbons can include single, double, or triple bonds as well. But what makes organic molecules different than hydrocarbons is that organic molecules can also include what are called heteroatoms. As you already know, hetero as a prefix means different. These are atoms that are different than just carbon and hydrogen. So organic molecules have a backbone of carbon and usually have many hydrogen atoms as well. But sometimes they have heteroatoms. Common ones include oxygen atoms nitrogen atoms, sulfur atoms, phosphorus atoms, and as we'll see, there can also be others. Also, organic molecules frequently have rings, meaning that they're cyclic, as well as branches, and we'll be getting into that in more detail later on. Now let's look at one interesting aspect of studying organic chemistry. So now that we know that organic chemistry studies carbon-based molecules, or molecules that have a carbon backbone, Let's look at some examples of organic molecules. This is actually the simplest or organic molecule that one can draw. It's comprised of one carbon and four hydrogen atoms bonded together through single bonds. This is called methane, and it's an example both of an organic molecule and it also happens to be a hydrocarbon. We know that it's an organic molecule because it has carbon at its core. And it's a hydrocarbon because, in addition to carbon, it has nothing else but hydrogen atoms. Let's look at a slightly more complex organic molecule. How about this one? This is an organic molecule. And even though there's a lot of information here, you'll notice right away the presence of a lot of carbon atoms, as well as atoms of hydrogen and a few other atoms of oxygen. The fact that it has a backbone or a framework of carbon is what makes it an organic molecule. This happens to be the molecule testosterone. If you think testosterone has a complex structure, let me show you an even larger organic molecule. You probably recognize this right away as being a portion of DNA. If you've studied DNA in any class before, you know that DNA is made up of smaller portions called base pairs. These base pairs actually have quite a bit of carbon as a backbone. And for this reason, DNA is often classified as an organic molecule. You'll notice that most base pairs contain carbon, as well as hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, and also a phosphorus atom. If there's one interesting thing to take away from these three different molecules, it's that organic chemistry can study everything from the very simple to the very complex. And while that's good news because it keeps things interesting, it makes it a little bit tougher to study organic molecules than the relatively simple molecules you probably saw in general chemistry. In general chemistry, we usually looked at simple molecules and talked about them in terms of things like their chemical formula or maybe we even drew their structure. Well, the complex nature of many organic molecules means we're going to need an easy way to look at them. If you spent 100 years studying organic chemistry, you probably couldn't actually see every last organic molecule that exists. And for this reason, we need to do something so we can speak more generally about organic molecules.
rather than just thinking about each individual molecule separately. The answer to this problem is by learning about functional groups. Now a functional group is actually a phenomenon that occurs in areas more than just organic chemistry. The fact is, in anything complex you look at, whether it's a molecule, whether it's a car, or whether it's the human body, different parts will tend to have different functions. Let's start by looking at a very, very complex organic mixture. I call this organic mixture kitten. When we look at the kitten, it's immediately familiar to us. Hopefully it also appeals to you as being cute. But you'll notice that it has different parts that have different functions. For instance, bear with me here, if I asked you what part of the kitten is used to see, right away you would say the eyes. And you'd recognize that the eyes are used for vision. If I asked you what part of the kitten is used to hear, you'd say right away the ears. So these are examples of a functional group. In other words, a part of a structure that's used for a function. Now here's why this is helpful. If you know that eyes are used to see and ears are generally used to hear, you can then recognize those functional groups even when we look at something you've never seen before. Something like this animal. This is a Malaysian taper. It's actually a juvenile one. And even though you may have never seen a taper before, I bet right away you can recognize what part of this animal is used for hearing the ears. Without having ever seen a taper before, if you haven't, you can recognize that that's probably the area of the animal where hearing will take place. Same thing, if you wanted to hide from this animal, you'd probably avoid its eyes. Without having any special knowledge of a taper as an animal, you can recognize different parts of it and how they function. So while this may seem like kind of a silly concept, this can be tremendously ha helpful in organic chemistry because if we learn how different parts of a molecule function, we can recognize those parts on many different molecules. So even if you've never seen testosterone or DNA before, it allows you to know how the different parts of the molecule will function. So while we won't get to study many kittens or tapers in organic chemistry, we will study a lot of molecules. And on the molecules, we'll learn to identify functional groups. Functional groups are basically just areas of the molecule that have a certain function. And usually we recognize them as being a particular combination of bonds and or atoms. So you might recognize specific atoms or the way they're bonded to each other. And because we'll learn about that as a functional group, we'll learn about how that particular functional group acts. Functional groups, in order to reach the classification of being a functional group, usually appear over and over again in many different molecules. So while technically you could look for any arrangement of bonds and atoms to reoccur, generally we look for ones that are persistent through many different molecules. The reason this is so important is that once we learn to recognize certain functional groups in molecules, we can very quickly make intelligent assumptions about how the molecule that has that functional group will behave. Functional groups are often responsible for the physical properties of a substance. So when we look at a substance on paper, we'll right away be able to look at the structure, determine what functional groups are present, and then draw conclusions about that molecule's solubility. Will it dissolve in water? Will it dissolve in oil? Uh, what temperature will it melt at? What temperature will it boil at? Will it be high or low? In addition to physical properties, it'll tell us how it will interact with other molecules. These are the, what are called intermolecular forces. So functional groups will help us determine intermolecular forces, and that's largely because they influence polarity, something we'll review from general chemistry. Functional groups also determine reactivity, or how a molecule reacts. So you can look at a structure that you've never seen before of a molecule, but if you recognize certain functional groups, right away you'll know, will this molecule be likely to combust if I apply heat? Will the molecule be likely to oxidize another substance? 
And finally, functional groups help us determine nomenclature, which is naming of molecules. Our first functional group that we're going to study is the functional group of alkanes. Our first functional group, alkanes, are really the simplest functional group that exists in organic chemistry. The upside to that is that they're pretty easy to learn about. The downside is they're not the most interesting molecules we'll study by far. But it's important to look at alkanes in detail because as we understand more about alkanes, you'll start to understand how we can look at more complex molecules. As a functional group, when we say a molecule is an alkane, we're referring to a hydrocarbon that has only single bonds. That means that the entire molecule can contain nothing but hydrogen and carbon, and those atoms can only be connected to each other through single bonds. That means there'll be carbon-hydrogen single bonds and carbon-carbon single bonds. There won't be any hydrogen-hydrogen single bonds because then it wouldn't be an organic molecule. So alkanes are essentially hydrocarbons with only single bonds. If a double bond or a triple bond was present, that molecule would no longer be classified as an alkane. Instead, we'd be looking at a different functional group, which we'll cover later this quarter, called either alkenes or alkynes. But alkanes are limited to hydrocarbons with just single bonds. The simplest alkane, which we've already seen, is also the simplest organic molecule and the simplest hydrocarbon. It's a molecule called methane. Notice that the carbon has four single bonds in order to complete its octet, and each one of those single bonds is connected to a hydrogen. If we were to add one more carbon to this molecule, it would become a molecule called ethane. We'll talk about how to name these molecules later, but for now, just notice how the structure changed. By adding an additional carbon, we also had to add additional hydrogen atoms to complete the octet. This process would continue if I add another carbon. A molecule that has three carbons in a line is what's called propane, and it's another example of an alkane. Each of these three molecules is a hydrocarbon because it contains just carbon and hydrogen, and it's an alkane because it only has single bonds. Let's stop for a second, though, to consider what these molecules would actually look like in three dimensions. In other words, let's consider their geometry. We already have noticed that all the carbons in an alkane have four single bonds touching them, and that allows the carbon to have a perfect octet. The result of this is that carbon's geometry is pretty easy to predict, and it's not actually the geometry that we tend to draw on paper. Notice that when I drew the methane before, it basically looks like a cross or an X or the letter T. That's not actually accurate when we consider what we should have learned in general chemistry about molecular geometry. If we were to put the molecule in this shape in three dimensions, it only separates each of the hydrogen atoms by 90 degrees, and that's not a very stable thing to happen. Instead, in three dimensions, this molecule has what's called tetrahedral geometry. If you remember tetrahedral geometry, most people visualize this like a camera tripod with a camera on top of it. It basically has three legs pointing in opposite directions, and then one leg sticking straight up. Of course, in this case, the legs are actually single bonds. Just as a little bit of review, Remember that you can always draw things that are coming towards you as a darkened triangle and anything going away from you with dashes. That's the conventional way that we'll see things drawn in organic chemistry. Why does methane have this special tetrahedral geometry instead of being flat and looking like an X as it is on the left side of the page? Well, the answer is that in tetrahedral geometry, the angle between each one of the bonds is about 109.5 degrees, and that's much more stable than the 90 degree angle that we see on the left side of the page. Even though it's perfectly okay to draw methane in either one of these forms, it's important to remember that this has an effect on all alkanes 
as well as all carbon molecules that have single bonds. The result is that we very rarely see straight lines in organic molecules. Let me use a three-dimensional model to show you how. These are commonly referred to as ball and stick models because the atoms are represented by balls and the lines are represented by sticks. Let's look at some ball and stick models for some different alkanes. When viewed in three dimensions, tetrahedral geometry reminds a lot of people of a camera tripod or a stand because we have three different single bonds all creating a platform for a fourth single bond on the top of the molecule. What's interesting about this in three dimensions is you'll notice that nowhere in the molecule, no matter which way I flip it, can you find a 90 degree angle, in other words, a perfect corner. Instead, what we see are the 109.5 degree angle that exists between all of the different bonds and atoms in tetrahedral geometry. This has some interesting consequences when it comes to looking at carbon-based molecules. For carbon-based molecules, in this case this black orb represents a carbon, in carbon-based molecules we rarely see anything that has linear geometry. In other words, we don't see straight lines or right angles, and this is especially true with carbons that have only single bonds. This has consequences for larger and more complex carbon-based molecules. We already know that this single carbon molecule is what we call methane, but look what happens if I replace one of those hydrogens with another carbon to build the next most complex hydrocarbon called ethane. You'll notice ethane has two carbons that create the backbone, and still we only see that 109.5 degree angle from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, or at any other point. And no matter which way I twist this molecule, we never see a truly straight line. We never see a 90 degree angle either. Now, let's look at a slightly more complex molecule. I'll move the methane out of the way, and let's look at what happens when I take ethane and I add another carbon to make propane. If this was my ethane molecule with another carbon, Notice that this means I can't continue making a straight line of carbons. So while I have a straight line between these two carbons, I can't have a straight line that connects all three of these carbons. The result of that is that when we start to see longer chains of carbon atoms in alkanes, we tend to notice that there's a kink or a turn or a corner that again has that 109.5 degree angle. If I move the ethane out of the way and I show you the propane with a four carbon structure, the four carbon structure is what's called butane. And when I have a four carbon structure, notice that I'm not going to have all four of those carbons in a straight line. Oh, that's three carbons. Let's put one more on there. Okay, so here is my four carbon structure, and just about the only way to organize it that has a nice regular repeating pattern is the way that we'll see a lot of organic structures. It's essentially as a zigzag. So the longer that these carbon chains get, because of the tetrahedral geometry, we don't see a straight line across the carbon atoms, we see more of a zigzag. And in fact, no matter how many carbons I attach to each other, I can pull off any of these hydrogens and replace them with carbons. As long as I continue making a relatively straight line of carbons, what I actually create is a zigzag. And you'll notice that this zigzag comes up a lot in organic chemistry models because that's usually the most stable way for the molecule to exist. Okay. Now that we've looked at what these molecules actually look like in three dimensions, let's talk about how we represent them on paper. This is basically the issue of writing out chemical formulas and structures. Now, in organic chemistry, we have to consider how to write them on paper in more detail than we may have used in general chemistry. And the reason is, in organic chemistry, our molecules tend to be much larger and much more complex. So on one hand, we need a reasonable way to use some shorthand so we can still write down complex molecules on paper.
The counter argument to that, however, is that we still need to represent in some detail at least certain functional groups within the molecule. So as a result, there's more than one correct way to write down organic structures on paper, and you'll see that different versions are used in different settings. Probably the rarest way that we'll actually use is the way that you tended to write down the identity of structures in general chemistry, that is, using their chemical formulas. You can always write the chemical formula for an organic molecule just by looking at what atoms are present, counting them up, and putting them together. For example, we've already seen molecules such as CH4, which was methane, or C3H8, propane. These are chemical formulas. We always write the carbon first in a chemical formula, and traditionally we write the hydrogen second, and any additional atoms would be written after that. The upside to chemical formulas is they're short and they're easy to read. The downside is they give us almost no structural information. And as our molecules get more complex, you'll see that this can be a problem. The alternative to chemical formulas that you might remember from general chemistry is drawing out a complete structure. You may have called this a Lewis structure. This is when you draw out all of the atoms, all of the bonds, and maybe you even started drawing dots for electron pairs. Methane would be drawn out as carbon with four single bonds and four hydrogen. Propane, likewise, would be drawn out with all of its atoms and all of its bonds. Lewis structures may or may not represent correct geometry. So you'll see here I'm using that flat, square, straight version of drawing these molecules, even though we've seen this doesn't represent them in three dimensions. The upside to these complete structures is they give you a lot of information. The downside is that they can get really large and really difficult to write out. So a lot of times in organic chemistry, what you'll decide to write is what's called a condensed structure. A condensed structure is basically a compromise between the detail of a complete structure and the succinctness and convenience of a chemical formula. Condensed structures are also flexible, so depending on the settings, you can choose to expand them or condense them as much as you like. Let's look at some examples of condensed structures. When writing a condensed structure, what we do in organic chemistry for clarity is we ensure that we're writing each carbon out individually as if we were writing an entire expanded Lewis structure, the big fancy one. The condensed part comes from the fact that we often choose to condense the atoms that are bonded to the carbon. And I say we can condense them because it's up to you. In some settings, it's convenient to condense them. In other ones, we prefer to keep them uncondensed for clarity. Let's look at an example. Here's our propane molecule from the previous page. Now, you could write the chemical formula for propane, but then it's hard to tell exactly what its structure is. So here's how we'd write the condensed structure for propane. First, I'd write each individual carbon. So I'll start with the carbon on the left. I write the C as if I was going to draw either a chemical formula or a structure. Then I condense it by looking at what's attached to the carbon. In addition to the bond that goes to the next carbon, I have three separate hydrogens. So to condense this, I'll write them as if they were in a formula, CH3. Then I can move on to the next carbon, which I'll write individually. You can draw a single bond here to represent the bond to that carbon, or you can choose to simply write things next to each other. I'll do both versions. This second carbon is attached to two hydrogen, as well as the next carbon in the chain. So I'll represent those two hydrogen by writing CH2. Again, whether or not I used a line to represent the single bond, it's implied. Go ahead and see if you can finish this condensed structure. My final carbon is this third carbon on the end, so either I can draw a line to represent that carbon, or I can just write it next in the chemical formula. When I do that, I see that it is also bonded to three hydrogens, so I need to write H with a subscript of a three, or a little three. So either one of these options, 
CH2, so pardon me, CH3 with a line to CH2 and another line to CH3 is correct, or I can simply leave out those lines which are implied and write CH3, CH2, CH3. This is a condensed structure. When working with condensed structures, you have the choice of whether or not you want to make those single bonds implied. You actually have the same choice when it comes to working with double or triple bonds. However, I recommend that you draw double or triple bonds out for the sake of clarity. Let me give you a more complex structure. Here's a molecule that has four carbons as well as several hydrogens, a double bond, and a fluorine. Take a second, pause the video, and see if you can write a condensed structure for this molecule. Okay. There are more than one correct way to write this structure in a condensed form. First I'll do the longest version. The longest version would be to start out with CH3, because I'm starting with this carbon. It's bonded to three hydrogens, and then I move on to the next carbon. If I want to be detailed, I can draw the single bond. Now this carbon is bonded to a fluorine and a hydrogen. You might recall that we usually write hydrogen first, and then anything else, in this case fluorine. That takes care of the two atoms that are directly bonded to my second carbon. Then I can draw a bond to show I'm now at my third carbon. This carbon has one hydrogen and nothing else bonded to it because of the double bond. Now again, it's an option whether or not you want to show the double bond, but for clarity I think it's a good idea. So I'll draw that double bond, which brings me to my final carbon, which has two hydrogens attached to it, CH2. This is essentially the longest way to draw the condensed structure. You could choose to leave out the single bonds. The answer then would be CH3, CHF, CH, and you could leave the double bond out, but I recommend keeping it in for clarity. Now when you look at that, especially at the start of your foray into organic chemistry, that does seem a little bit like a jumble of different letters. But remember, we know that in organic chemistry, carbon is the backbone. So for each carbon atom, anything that comes directly after it must be bonded to it. In other words, this carbon is bonded to three hydrogens. This carbon is bonded to one hydrogen and one fluorine. You can tell because it's what comes immediately after the carbon. And remember, it's your choice how much to condense. If having this fluorine written in condensed form is confusing, you have the option of leaving it in an uncondensed form. For instance, I might choose to write this structure with the fluorine separately. Let me show you what that would look like. I'll erase this version and rewrite it in a form that would look clear and easy for me to read. I would write CH3, uh, maybe I'd choose to draw a bond and write CH, and then I could show that the fluorine is connected by a single bond. Then I would continue with my condensed formula. So notice there is a lot of flexibility when it comes to condensing structures, but within the first couple days of working through different exercises in this class, you will be incredibly thankful that you no longer need to write out every single bond that's present in a molecule. If you have any questions about how much condensing might be too much, you can always check with me. Different chemists use different amounts of condensing, and the most important thing is that your final structure should be fairly easy to understand. Finally, let's talk about the simplest structure that you can possibly draw in organic chemistry. We've seen that chemical formulas are very simple, Lewis structures are far more complex, and condensed structures try to take some balance between those two. But we haven't talked about the way that most organic chemists choose to draw their molecules, and that's in terms of what's called a line drawing or a line structure. Line drawings and line structures will probably become your favorite way to draw organic molecules this quarter because they are so simple. They save us so much time and so much confusion. And why do they save us all of this time? Well, the fact is, line drawings allow us to imply a great deal of information, so we won't have to actually write it out. What information is implied? 
Well, have you noticed that in all of these structures, we've had to write out a lot of carbon and a lot of hydrogen because they're present in all organic molecules? Well, this is what makes line drawings so simple. They leave the carbons and the hydrogens off of the molecule by allowing them to be implied. How on earth is it okay to leave off carbon and hydrogen? Well, the answer has to do with that tetrahedral geometry we've been talking about. Remember when we looked at the models, I showed you that if you put four carbons together in a row, you create the molecule butane. And those four carbons don't form a perfectly straight, flat line. Instead, they formed what we can refer to as a zigzag. Each time a carbon is connected to another carbon, there's a 109.5 degree angle, as long as we're talking about carbons that just have single bonds. The result is that the butane molecule has a very recognizable zigzag that goes through all four of those carbons. What a line structure allows you to do is take advantage of that zigzag shape. Believe it or not, an organic chemist could easily draw butane like this. It looks a little bit like a mountain and a valley, but there's enough information there to tell an organic chemist that you're dealing with butane. How is that possible? Well, as we'll see momentarily, anytime a line starts, ends, or changes direction, it implies that a carbon is present. That means that each one of these locations on the molecule must have a carbon atom. So it's easy to tell that there were four carbon atoms connected by single bonds. As for the hydrogen, because these carbons have only single bonds, we know that each one must have a total of four bonds touching it. For this carbon on the left-hand side, there's one single bond that's drawn, which implies there must be three other single bonds, which must be going to hydrogen atoms. And sure enough, that's exactly what appears in the butane molecule. For any of the carbons that has two bonds attached to it, that we can see as lines that are drawn in the structure, there must be two implied bonds that have hydrogens on them. So in this way, just drawing a simple zigzag allows chemists to understand that you're actually dealing with a molecule that has carbons and hydrogens. They're simply left to be implied. Let's look at some of the details of doing these line structures. The biggest thing in understanding line drawings and line structures is to know which parts of a structure imply that a carbon is present and which ones don't. As I mentioned, Anywhere that a line starts, stops, or changes direction must symbolize that a carbon is present. So you can think of this as anywhere that you see an angle, anywhere that you see an intersection, or anywhere a line starts or ends. We saw on butane that each place where the line starts, ends, or changes directions must have a carbon, and we can tell how many hydrogen are present just by determining how many bonds must be implied. This is also true for molecules that have branches. In other words, their zigzag splits. Here's an example of a molecule that has a branch. See if you can identify everywhere that a carbon exists in this line drawing. Just like before, anywhere that a line starts or ends must have a carbon present. So we can already tell that there are three carbon on the ends of these lines. Then anywhere that a line changes direction or has an intersection must have a carbon. So here and here we have carbons present. Furthermore, we know how many hydrogens are present at each location. Anywhere we are at the end of a line, we must have a carbon with three hydrogens attached. Anywhere where we're in between two lines, we must have a carbon with two hydrogens attached. And in this case, this intersection shows a carbon with three single bonds all going to other carbons, so there must also be one other hydrogen attached to that carbon. Can you figure out what the chemical formula of this structure would be? Take a minute, pause the video, and see if you can correctly figure out the chemical formula for this structure. To determine the chemical formula, I have to know how many carbon and hydrogen are present. 
We already said that everywhere a line starts, ends, change direction, or there's an intersection, a carbon is present. In this case, there's a carbon here, 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 and here. That's a total of five carbon. Now I have to figure out how many hydrogen are present. Everywhere that a line ended, there must be three hydrogen. So that implies here, here, and here. That gives me a total of nine hydrogen plus two hydrogen here and one more here for a total of 12 hydrogen. The chemical formula for this structure would be C5H12. The other things that you'll tend to run into in line drawings are multiple bonds, meaning double or triple bonds, and heteroatoms. Let's look at how we deal with each of those. Just as we show each single bond in a line drawing, so we also need to show the double and triple bonds. And those are done just by drawing a double or a triple bond the same way we would do it in a Lewis structure. For instance, if I'm drawing a, a line drawing of a molecule that has a double bond, I basically double up the lines where that double bond occurs. Be careful because this will also change the number of hydrogen that are implied on that molecule because a double bond helps a carbon to get closer to reaching its perfect octet. In this case, the carbon on each end of this double bond now need fewer hydrogen to be stable. How many hydrogen are attached to this carbon? You can see that that carbon already has a single bond, which is attached to another carbon, and a double bond attached to another carbon. That gives it a total of six electrons, which means it must need one more single bond attached to a hydrogen. We don't draw any of this detail when doing a line structure, but it's important to know that it's there. The same thing would be true for this carbon. It must be attached to one hydrogen. You'll notice that sometimes the geometry for double bonds is different. Sometimes we have a zigzag with a double bond in it. Other times you'll see what looks more like a plateau or a valley. These have the same meaning in terms of the structure of the molecule, but they do imply a difference in geometry. When we get into our next functional group, alkenes, which are essentially hydrocarbons with double bonds, we'll talk more about when to draw which version of the structure. For now, most people feel more comfortable sticking with the zigzag, but both are technically correct. Finally, when it comes to dealing with triple bonds, you may see triple bonds drawn out in a line drawing, but most people find them to be more problem than they're worth. To draw a triple bond, you'd have to draw three lines. But you may recall from general chemistry that a triple bond expressly implies that there's linear geometry in the carbons that are attached to it. So if I were to draw the complete structure, it would look like this. This is actually a molecule called acetylene. The problem with turning this into a line structure is that I'd have to draw all three of those lines for the bond, and then I'd essentially be attaching them to another line for a single bond. This is probably not the best option for clarity. So when dealing with triple bonds, it's common, even in line structures, to show the carbon that are attached just for the sake of understanding. Finally, this brings us to the last thing you'll notice in line drawings, which is that they can be used regardless of whether you're dealing with a hydrocarbon or a molecule that's more complex and has heteroatoms, such as chlorine, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, or any other element. Those non-carbon atoms are always shown in the structure. For instance, here's an example of an organic molecule that has a fluorine atom. The only thing I want to mention is notice that when we draw the fluorine, it exists at the end of a line. This invalidates the rule that the end of a line must have a carbon atom. This literally means that there's a single bond attached to the fluorine. What it does not mean is that there's a single bond to a carbon and then a fluorine. So don't make that mistake. In this case, there would be a carbon at the end of each of these lines, as well as a carbon here and here. There'd be four carbons, as well as the hydrogen and a fluorine atom.
This is very common when dealing with organic molecules for things like fluorine atoms, chlorine atoms, and especially you'll run into a lot of organic molecules that have oxygen. This is a molecule called butanol. It's an alcohol. The OH on the end implies that there's an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen. And in turn, we can see that that oxygen is connected to a carbon. If I was drawing the complete structure, it might look something like this. Of course, each one of these carbons, oxygens, and hydrogens would have to also have a complete octet. But notice that drawing a line structure allows us to leave out some of those details. By the way, you'll notice that heteroatoms are very frequently single bonded to carbon, but occasionally are also double bonded. In fact, we'll see lots of carbon double bonded to oxygen in this course. Don't be alarmed by the fact that this starts to give us some pretty interesting line structures. This is a classic example because this is the molecule acetone. The real structure of this molecule, let's say I drew it in a condensed form, would look like this. A carbon double bonded to an oxygen, and notice that at the ends of each of these lines, I must have another carbon with the appropriate number of hydrogen. So this would be the condensed form of acetone as compared with the line structure. Let's do a little bit of practice. I'm going to give you a condensed structure and I'd like you to turn it into a line structure. You can do this directly from the condensed structure or if you want you can take some time and draw the expanded structure. Here's the condensed version I'll give you. Take some time and see if you can draw this structure in a line drawing form. Okay, how'd you do? There's a lot to consider here because I'm asking you to consider double bonds, heteroatoms, as well as the information that's found in a condensed structure. The first thing I would recommend doing is isolating the individual carbons. It'll make it easier to see what we're doing. So I have a highlighter in this case. You can also circle these on your own paper, but I'm going to go through and find out where are my carbons, so later it'll be easier to tell exactly what they're bonded to. Most of the time when dealing with line structures, people like to start by drawing a zigzag and then go back and adjust what they need to do. Notice in this case I basically have a line of carbons with a double bond, a bromine, and also this extra carbon sticking off it. In this case, I have a total of seven carbons, but six of them are essentially in a line. So I might draw it like this. I put my pen down, and that represents the first carbon. I draw my first line, and that represents the second carbon. Here's my third, fourth, fifth, and sixth carbon. Notice that this seventh carbon is actually attached to the fifth one. It doesn't matter whether your zigzag looks upside down from the one I've just drawn, and this carbon bond here might be pointing up. That doesn't make any difference in the way we interpret the structure. So now I've got the carbon backbone. I don't have to do anything for the hydrogen because they're implied, but I do need to go back and make sure that I've included any double bonds as well as heteroatoms. In this case, there's a double bond that exists between the first and second carbon. I'll draw that by locating the first and second carbon on the structure and just adding a line. That line can be above or below the existing line. It doesn't make any difference. Then I notice that I have a bromine. This bromine is attached to the fourth carbon because it comes after that fourth carbon in the chemical formula. So I locate my fourth carbon, one, two, three, four, and I draw the bromine coming off of it. Again, in this case, the bromine appears to point up. I'm mostly doing that to spread out these lines as well as possible. This would be the correct line structure for the condensed structure I drew at the top of the screen. There's plenty more practice on line structures in the problems in the book as well as some of the extra practice homework that's available on ANGEL.